Good morning, Hillcrest, and good morning to our brothers and sisters who are worshiping with us online. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised he is to be feared above all gods. We have come to worship God this morning, and let us bow our heads as we invite the great God of the universe to be with us. Heavenly Father, we have come again on this thy Sabbath day to your house of worship. Lord, as we begin this service, we ask for your spirit to come and to reign with us, to guide us and to keep us. Bless everyone who is watching this program and listening and those brothers and sisters who are, have come Give them a blessing for being here today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name that everyone say, Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Hillcrest. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand and join us as we welcome our guest of honor into his house.
the blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. And our hymn of the morning is just that, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Help us sing today. Blessed assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Happy Sabbath, Hillcrest. So good to be in the house of the Lord today, amen. We want to welcome you as we gather together as a community to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's all about Him, amen. He is the number one focus today. He is the primary audience. And so as we worship Him today, I want to invite you to, to lift your heart and song and in praise to His wonderful and holy name. I want to take a moment also just to welcome those of you who are watching with us online. Uh, we pray that you are being blessed by the worship thus far and that you are sensing the presence of the Lord wherever you are. We want to take a moment also just to, I see some uh, visitors here with us today. We want to welcome, their, welcome them here uh, with us. If you don't mind just waving your hand. I know Brother Hassel brought a good friend with him. And just that quickly, I think his name escaped me, but it's so good to see you. Um, this morning. We're so glad that you came to worship with us today. I also see some other familiar faces. Some of you haven't been here in a while because of various reasons, some health challenges. I see Brother Hill over there. Uh, so good to see you, Brother Hill. I also see, I think, sitting behind me, if I'm not correct, that's Hector. Is that Hector? Amen. Haven't seen Hector since before COVID, and it's so good to see you, my brother. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us on today. And so we just want to uh, just again acknowledge uh, those of us who are here together in worship. I just want to bring to your attention just a couple individuals that we want to keep um, before the Lord in prayer. Um, many of you know Brother Victor Labou. Um, he recently lost a family member, but his father is not doing well in Jacksonville. And so he told me this week that he's planning to, more than likely, he's going to be relocating 
um, to Jacksonville to take care of him. And so I asked him, I said, man, we'd love to see you before you make that final move. And so by God's grace, uh, Brother Labou, if you're watching today, he said he's still watching us, but if you're watching today, we hope that when you make that move that you will come and allow us the opportunity to say goodbye. But we're praying for you and we're praying for your family and your father. Also want to ask that you would keep Sister Sonia um, uh, Bennett in uh, your prayers. She is in Vanderbilt ICU. And so we just want to continue to lift her up in prayer as well. Um, as many of you know, the last couple of weeks, you all, you heard about my wife and she tore her Achilles heel, but she is here with us today. And I want to thank you on behalf of her for all of your prayers, the meals, your support, the texts, the calls, the cards. We really appreciate it. We got her a knee scooter and she was so excited when she got that knee scooter. She could kind of move a lot quicker and do more things that she would like to do. Amen. And so it's so good to see her here today. And we thank you again for all your love and support. As you know, um, we're getting ready this weekend as the South Central Conference uh, constituency meeting where we select um, and nominate the leaders of our conference. And we just want to continue to ask that you would uh, lift up the conference in prayer um, tomorrow. If you do want to watch the proceedings of what is happening, you can go to the South Central Conference uh, website, and there you can find a link if you want to watch vicariously and see virtually, rather, um, what is happening at the meeting. Again, we want to pray for the whole process and all of our delegates, some who are traveling there even today um, in preparation for this weekend. And so again, we just want to lift them up and the, and the delegates. Lastly, today is our outreach Sabbath, and so you see some of us are dressed down today. And the plan is today to go and visit after church our sick and shut-in members. But also we're doing a partnership with Dream Streets. That's the ministry just uh, to my left, your right. Um, they're doing a food giveaway today at 2.30 um, at the Covenant Church here in Nashville. And so we, we want to invite you to come out and be a part of that. Um, they will be giving away um, food boxes today. And so, again, we're looking forward to the, our outreach Sabbath. We want to encourage you uh, to join us as we go and reach the world for Jesus Christ. Well, at this time, we're going to prepare to turn our hearts to God in prayer. And so we want to invite you even now to begin asking the Lord uh, to draw nigh as you draw nigh to him. Amen. It's prayer time and praise the Lord that he hears our prayers and that they avail much. When we pray, when we pray, we believe, we receive what we ask in his name.
It's prayer time. A time that we all look forward to when it comes to talking to the Lord. I'm so glad to be here this morning. And I know you all are too. So, without further ado, let's bow our heads on our knees, however you're comfortable. And let's give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Loving Lord of the wide expanses of all creation, yet you are individual enough that the whimper of a baby escapes not thy hearing. Come, dear Lord, and abide with us in labor as our energies may be productive for good. Lord, travel with us in our comings and goings, that our destinations may be noble and holy of purpose. We realize, Heavenly Father, there are times when we may face confusion and accidents, but it's our prayer, Lord, it is our prayer that you would strengthen, strengthen our minds that we will not forget thee. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our ears, that we will always hear thee. Last but not least, strengthen our will, that we will always obey thee. Bless us, Heavenly Father, to be the answer and not the problem for peace and harmony in all areas of life. Lord, we just thank you again for this holy, holy day. Lord, we pray. I must, I will reiterate the pastor just said, we want to pray for our sick and shut in. Those members that have lost loved ones, we want to lift them up. Those that are dealing with health challenges, we want to continue to pray for them. And Lord, as our pastor bring us the word, we pray that you will give him a double portion of your Holy Spirit and take everything out of us that will keep us from hearing your word. And Lord, we'll be grateful, blessed, to give you all the praise, all of our praise. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen. Praise the Lord. I was getting ready for praise and worship this week, and my son, Jaden, was with me, and he was listening to the words. He got to a part of the song, and he didn't understand it. He said, Mommy rocks can't talk. And so I said, but if God tells the rocks to talk, they'll talk. But we don't want the rocks to talk, because that means we weren't giving him the praise that's due his name. The song says, I came to magnify the Lord. I came to glorify. I came to praise. At this point, if you can, we'd ask you to stand or when, uh, whatever way you can give God the praise. Give him that praise today.
excited not to let that rock cry out for your praise. Amen. And he's worthy of that praise. He's the lamb that was slain. He's the lamb that's worthy of all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. And this song just says, glory to the lamb. We give all the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He deserves all our praise. Amen. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask God's blessing on his preach word today. Father, Lord, all of the glory and the honor and the praise belongs to you. And this morning, Lord, you have been here. You've been turning our hearts towards you. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see and hearts to hear your word to us today. May we be transformed in this moment by your grace. This is our prayer in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Let everyone say amen. Just last September, a group of friends living in Turkey were out drinking one night when one of their friends wandered off drunkenly into the nearby woods and didn't return. Worried, they notified the authorities and immediately a search and rescue mission was put together. The search was initially unproductive, and the search party, unable to find a trace, any trace of the missing man, even though they were focusing on the area where he was last seen. After, after some time searching, the members of the search party began calling out for the man and shouting his name loudly in hopes that he would hear them and respond. That was when a man within the group stepped forward and said, who are we looking for? I'm right here. Apparently, this missing man was so drunk, he had joined his own search party. <laughs> and he was with the group the entire time looking for himself. So often as believers... We set out searching for people we think are lost, hoping to rescue them when we are the ones that need to be rescued, not realizing that we're often just as lost as they are. You see, family, we tend to focus on the wrongdoing of others while simultaneously oblivious to our own sins and shortcomings. But the good news of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that he is seeking to rescue us all and is calling for us all to leave all to follow him. And I want to explore with you together this morning Christ's call to us and the most essential requirement needed in order to fully accept his invitation and experience his freedom from sin and self. That's the focus of our message today in a sermon simply entitled, Called. I want to invite you to grab your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. And I want to read from the English Standard Version of the Bible, starting in verse 9. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9. And I want to read in your hearing all the way to verse 13. And here's how the Word of God reads. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. 
I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The people following Jesus do not fit the usual religious profile. They are not weekly, regular Sabbath worship attendees. They do not hold a church office or serve as an esteemed member of the community. They're not invited to pray publicly or to share any words of wisdom with the community, to sit on the church board or any of the committees. They're not invited to read aloud or expound on the sacred scriptures. In fact, not only are they not well-versed in all of the doctrines of Scripture, they do not practice the rituals and the traditions that are supposed to serve as key indicators of just how holy and righteous they are. Until now, there has been absolutely no indication by the way they live their lives that they were in any way concerned with the values or the reception of the kingdom of heaven into their hearts. But here they are, the Bible says, many tax collectors and many sinners. There has been until now no seemingly interest um, for their entire life about anything spiritual. They do not fast twice a week like others do. They do not pray three times a day. They do not meticulously keep the laws of God or the laws designed to keep them from breaking the laws of God. They have spent their lives living completely at odds with what God requires. But when they meet Jesus, Something comes over them, and they are unable to resist his invitation to follow him. In fact, the most unlikely, the self-serving of all sinners, a known extortioner and oppressor of his own people, abandons everything to follow Jesus. Matthew, who, unlike the other disciples, has great wealth, yet he leaves it all behind and attaches himself to Jesus. Give me one second. I'm getting, I'm getting, getting revved up, Maurice. <laughs> Are you all with me? Amen, amen, amen. Okay. I'm going to keep preaching, okay? All right, all right. All right, let me see where, where was I? I t thank you, thank you. <laughs> he leaves everything. Matthew now leaves everything and attaches himself to Jesus. He cannot resist Jesus' call. And in response, he devotes his entire life to him. That's what the word there means, that he follows him. All right. Test, test. Are we there? Okay. All right. Thank you for that. However, hear me now. This is not, Matthew's response is not the response of the religious community. The people who are supposed to represent God and reveal his character to the lost people the ones who practice all the rituals and the traditions of the church, who know all the doctrines, who keep the standards, who lead out and try to live holy, they reject him. They have devoted their entire lives to serving him and trying to be like him, but when he comes, they are repulsed by Jesus. But why? On the surface, it seems that their primary problem with Jesus is that he hangs out with sinners. 
and that he welcomes them into his company, that he somehow, by sharing a meal with them, that he is condoning their sinful lifestyle and that he is essentially overlooking their sins and just how wretched and undeserving they are of grace. But the real problem, stay with me now, beloved, with him is that Jesus, hear me now, has made it abundantly clear that they are no better off than the tax collectors and the prostitutes. In other words, they are sinners too. And they are just as much in need of his grace but they refuse to believe his diagnosis. They don't want to believe that they're really sick and in need of healing. It is why Jesus says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus has come to heal the sickness of the soul. He has been trying to impress upon them their need, but they remain in denial. In 1969, psychiatrist Elizabeth Kuber Ross published a book entitled On Death and Dying. And in it, she outlines five stages of grief, grief based on her extensive work that she did as a medical resident in a New York City hospital. She had been working with terminally ill people who were facing death. And the first stage she discovered that she cites that when patients are confronted with the reality that they will have to die, she says, is denial. She describes denial as a conscious or an unconscious decision to refuse to admit that something is true. In other words, they refuse to believe that they have to die. Jesus' message of repentance, the abandonment of the death of self, hit a nerve with the religious followers because Jesus Jesus' message of repentance exposed that everything they had learned and put their confidence in was insufficient for salvation. His message revealed that the path to eternal life begins with the death of self. By the way, that is the reason why we are baptized and immersed underwater, and we hold our breath. It is signifying, symbolizing the death of ourselves in Jesus. All this time, they had spent improving themselves, and now they were hearing that none of it meant anything, not in the eyes of their heavenly Father, and not in the eyes of Jesus. And because they didn't want to do or submit themselves to the death of self, they refuse to believe anything he said. They were in denial, grieving that they had to die. Jesus' message has not changed even today. He wants us to know that we are sick and in need of a physician. We all stand in need of healing for our souls, no matter how many good deeds we perform, no matter how deliberate we are at trying to keep the law, no matter how much we know about the Bible or our Adventist lifestyle, our rituals and our standards, no matter what position we hold, how long we've been a member, our family name, our family history, or how old we are, no matter who we are, we are all sick and in need of a physician. And let me tell you something right now. Some of you are offended even right now at the thought. I'm not sick. But because of sin, our very nature is fallen. We've all been infected. Nobody.
everybody here is free from the corrupting influence of sin. And the sooner we realize it, it is the quicker Jesus can do his work in our souls. The truth is, beloved, that we all stand in need of healing. And hear me now. No matter how much stuff we overcome, no matter how much success we experience in getting rid of certain habits, no matter how much we improve ourselves, we are still sick. The author David Benner in his book Surrender to Love says, we want a spirituality of improvement, not a spirituality of transformation. Oh, you're not with me today. In other words, most Christians don't want to go through the deep work of transformation. We don't want to deal with the lies in our soul. We don't want to go beneath the surface because it involves suffering and the death of self. We would rather focus on just being better. Not realizing that focusing on just improving ourselves allow us to remain in denial about our true condition. And hear me now, beloved. When this happens, the only thing left for us to do is to pretend. When we do not allow Jesus to deal with what's deep in our soul, then we live a life of pretense. We pretend that there is no sin down there that Jesus needs to uproot. NASCAR Motor Speedway in Indianapolis. See, my son loves NASCAR. I knew he would perk up when I said NASCAR. So I had to look at him and he, he perked up. <laughs> NASCAR Motor Speedway in Indianapolis where they host the Indianapolis 500. We all have heard about it. They say that as soon as the track closes on the day an accident has taken place, the crew heads out and paints over the spot where the cars hit the wall. They say over the years that no driver has ever been pronounced dead on, at the racetrack. Even if you go to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, located right there in the, in, the, in the track facility, they say there is no memorial of the 40 drivers who have died on the tracks. Nowhere is there any mention of their names. But they reveal the rationale. They do this because they don't want the drivers to have to deal with death. They want them just to pretend it never happened so they can keep on driving. Are y'all with me today? We often are just like the NASCAR Motor Speedway organizers, wanting just to pretend that there is nothing wrong, that there's nothing in our character that needs to be uprooted. No sin in our life that needs to be transformed. We want to pretend not only with ourselves, but we want to pretend with each other. Like there is nothing wrong between us. Like there are no idols in the community that need to be torn down and uprooted and self-dethroned. Not only do we not want to pretend with ourselves and each other, but we also want to pretend with God. We pretend uh, by doing good deeds, saying good things, Maranatha, Happy Sabbath, giving our time and our talents, all in hopes he will overlook the sin still lodged inside of our heart. We pretend with Jesus. The greatest deception for religious sinners, there is a such a thing as religious sinners. <laughs> sinners who think because of their knowledge of Scripture and the truth that it makes them somehow exempt 
from repentance. Oh, I repented 30 years ago. Oh, I repented six years. No, every day is a day of repentance. It is something that must happen continually. These individual religious sinners, they somehow, we somehow tell ourselves, we somehow believe that we will get a pass from actually becoming like Jesus Christ. Hmm. I'm going to say that one more time. Hmm? Religious sinners believe that God is going to overlook their character. Religious sinners believe that being loving like Jesus doesn't matter. Religious sinners believe that it doesn't matter how I treat my neighbor. Religious sinners believe that they will get an exempt, be exempt from their character, being shaped and molded into the character of Jesus Christ. But that is at the heart of the gospel. If we are not becoming like Jesus, then who are we becoming like? Who are we in the presence of? Who are we coming to worship? And are we really worshiping him if we're not being transformed? We think because of our contributions to the church that we are excused. We think that because of our long history in the church that we are exempt from having the character of Christ. And we think that our adherence to Adventist lifestyle makes us exempt from being loving. Oh, it's a deep sickness, one that we don't want to confront. And this was the problem with the religious in Jesus' day and why he says in verse 13, he says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hmm, it's a cryptic word here. I'm trying to unpack it for you. Here Jesus reminds them of a time. This is a quotation actually from the Old Testament in Hosea. He says, the time in history of Israel when they thought because they came to worship and offered sacrifices on the altar that it absolved them from loving God. Many of them were serving him, but they didn't love him. And they didn't know that they were called to love him and that Jesus' call, hear me now, beloved, is really a call to love him and to be loved by him. In Hosea 6, verse 5, Jesus describes the fickleness of their love. He says it's like the dew that falls in the morning that that disappears before the sun rises. In other words, Jesus is saying that the call to follow him is an invitation to love him in in perpetuity, to love him with our whole heart, but most of all, do not really love him. That's why he says, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. I desire love, not sacrifice. Let me explain a little bit more. What he's saying to them, they were coming, bringing offerings to the altar and their good behavior and their service, their tithes and offering, and they were giving it to God, but it was not in response to his love or because of love. But God says, I don't want your sacrifice. I want your heart. I want your love, he says. I desire mercy. I desire your love, not your offering. It's okay, but it doesn't mean anything if it's not given from a heart of love for me. You see, we can perform all the duties and rituals but not have love for Jesus in our hearts. And the lack of love in our hearts is always revealed in our treatment of one another. 
Lack of love is revealed in condescending disdain and impatience with the faults and the shortcomings of others as well as the disregard for what might be their soul need. When we forget that every human being is created in the image of God, that they are a soul for whom Christ died, it is a sign that all of our service and all of our worship is nothing more than a form of godliness. Jesus says, For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, my invitation can only be received by the person who recognizes his need for me. It is the person who knows and accepts that there is no amount of good deeds that can erase their need for healing in their soul. See, some of us, we're trying to medicate our hearts with our good deeds. But only Jesus can deal with what's in our heart. This person, Jesus says, the person that recognizes their need, he says they are blessed. That's what he says in Matthew 5, verse 3. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you're not with me today. Jesus is saying that the person who is aware of their poverty of soul, who is conscious of their spiritual need, who knows that without Jesus they are poor and destitute and just a beggar waiting to be filled, he says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you're not with me today. Oh, let me say it another way. The only the person who knows that they are limited, hmm, that they don't have enough willpower, And hear me now, and are frightened when they look at the person in the mirror. Only that person can receive the kingdom of heaven. Hmm? Hmm? Only that person's heart can Jesus fill. Only that person's heart can be a space for the holy Shekinah glory of God. A heart that is free, that recognizes that unless Jesus comes in to the soul temple, there is no hope for them. The only thing we need for Jesus to transform our hearts is the deep conviction and recognition of our need. And beloved, it is only when we are convinced of our need that Jesus can transform our hearts. And I love what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, and he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or think. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And the very thing that you believe you will never overcome, Jesus says, I can do it if you let me. I can mend broken hearts and broken relationships. I can deliver you from your addictions. I can give you my character. I want to pour my love inside of your heart so that you can be filled with joy and peace. He says, I can do it if you let me. If you would finally be convinced that you need me. See, that's the problem with the religious sinners. They're puffed up because of their knowledge. And so Jesus can't come in. Matthew knew he was a sinner. Those prostitutes, they knew they were a sinner. And so they had no problem responding to him. But it's the religious. And I want to tell you today that it is blessed, as Jesus said, to be poor in spirit because it is then that he is able to 
come in. I want to close with a story. Came across a story that in 1988, there was a television program right before the Winter Olympics that featured blind skiers being trained in skiing downhill. Blind. I want you to picture this. Imagine this with me now. Blind skiers skiing downhill. And how they trained them, they paired them with skiers that could see, right? And so they were taught how to navigate the flats and how to make left and right turns. And when they mastered these things, they were taken all the way up on a slope. And then they would come down, but all the while, the one who could see was right there skating with them. And he would shout out, turn to the right, turn to the left. And as, as, they, were, as they were coming down the hill with them, as long as they listened to the voice of the one that trained them, they were able to successfully navigate all the way down to the bottom of the hill. And I want to tell you today, family, that we're all sick and blind. But the one who can see has come right into our hearts. He's right next to us. He is speaking to us now. And when we live our lives in his presence, all we got to do is listen to his voice. Go left. I hear you, Jesus. Go right. Yes, Master. I want you not to go that way. Yes, God. What Jesus wants to do is to give us his presence, his life. And the only way is to repent, is to say yes. Will you do that today?
So my appeal is simply this. For us here today, do we want a spirituality of just self-improvement? Or do we want a spirituality that transforms our hearts and makes them like Jesus' heart? Do you want Jesus to transform you on the deepest level? If you're convinced that this is what you need, I want to invite you to stand, and I'm going to pray that the Lord will do just that. Not just for you, but for me. What I found, I don't know if you've ever been cleaning and you the more you clean, the more you realize how dirty something is. <laughs> you start seeing things that you didn't even see from a distance. That's right. That's right. And here's, that's how the Christian journey is. The more, the closer we get to Jesus, it's the more we realize just how much cleaning we really need. And that's not a bad thing. Because when that means that you're in the arms of the one that can do all the cleansing and the fixing. So today we're standing because we're saying yes to Jesus. I don't want a superficial relationship with you. I want you to come and transform my heart. That's what we're praying for today. Then my second appeal is this for the person today that maybe has come here today. You've never given your heart to him. You identify with Matthew and those who were there in the crowd that you never even thought that Jesus would be concerned about you. You didn't know that what was in your heart, the discouragement you felt, that there was an answer, that there was a solution to your deep inner need. And today, you saw the face of the one who is calling you. And if you want to respond to his invitation today for the first time, I want to invite you to slip out of your seat wherever you are. Come down to the front. If you want to give your heart and be baptized, if this is you today, we want to invite you to come down front so that we can meet you. We'll have someone come alongside you and study the Word of God with you. Are you here today? Are you here today? Sing that together. Help me know you are near. Oh, you're all I want. You're all I need, Lord. You're Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, Lord, we are standing here today, for Lord, we want you to come in. We see today that it's okay to not have the answers. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to allow you into the deep recesses of our hearts. For you promised us that when we recognize our need, that we are in need of a healing physician that you come and you provide exactly what we need. And so some of us, we've been sensing our deep inner need for years, for decades. And we haven't known how to deal with it. And so we've made up and constructed a life just to medicate, to pretend it's not there, to ignore it. But today, because you love us so much, you will not allow us to stay in that place. And so, Lord, today we ask, we invite you to come in and break up the fallow ground of our hearts so that we might be filled and transformed.
by you. This is our prayer in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Let everyone say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you're like me and thankful for the message, inspirational message we just received, just say amen. I thank the Lord for uh, that message, Pastor. Uh, it's time in the service where we have an opportunity to return unto the Lord the tithes and offerings. There are several ways to give. The preferred method is to go to the Hillcrest website, which is hillcrestnashville.org, and click Donate and follow the directions. Or you can go to Cash App, and our Cash App address is dollar sign the Hill Nashville. You can call area code 615-307-0940 and someone will come and pick up your offerings. Or you can do uh, and bring them to the church and leave them in a secure, in our secure mailbox. At this time, the deacons are wait upon us for the morning's tithes and offerings. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the great God of the universe. Heavenly Father, sustainer, creator, giver of all good gifts, we come to you this morning just thankful for the opportunity to return unto you the tithes and offerings. Lord, we pray that you bless every giver, bless those who have to give and those who have it not. May it go to uplift your name throughout the world and hasten your soon coming is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord just a little bit more praise? Can we bless the Lord? Say, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. And all. And
Amen and amen. We had a good time today. Then we church. He brought the word. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless you. Well, will you stand with me now for dismissal? Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave this place, we thank you, dear Lord, for every blessing. And now, we pray that you will be beneath us to lift us up, above us for shelter, behind us for protection, and in front of us to leave us on. And Lord, we'll be very, very careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. Thy will be done. In Jesus' name, let the church say, Amen. As we prepare to get out of here, just a couple of announcements. One, F.H. Jenkins is looking for a middle school math and science teacher. Um, so please um, hit up F.H. Jenkins, FHJPrep.net for details. Uh, they're also having a constituency meeting for F.H. Jenkins on Wednesday. Uh, at 6 30 it will be at F.A. Jenkins and that's not as bad as it used to be because they have air conditioning now so it's not going to be like it used to be um, number three uh, remember today is outreach day so please reach out to uh, those that are sick and those who are not able uh, to move around as easily um, oh and also do the other things that the pastor talked about earlier um, on Osage Street you know but anyway, uh, as you all rise, room, please, if you have not subscribed yet, go ahead and do that on YouTube. Uh, hit the thumbs up on this video. Share it with directly who someone who needs to hear it and come back and do it again next week. Please do it everyone who is going pray for everyone who's going to be at the constituency meeting tomorrow. Uh, what, I just want you to know, today is yellow day for the ushers. All right? And... If you want to schedule of all the colors, just ask Miss Sally. She will let you know what colors to wear each week because she reminds me every week about which color is supposed to be here and what's supposed to be there. But anyway, all right, happy to happen.